Yes, now I'm recording. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm really glad to see you back here. Uh, today is a very important session for us. Uh, in the previous sessions, we clearly mapped out the problems mining causes in regard to human rights or the environment. And we also already looked at different solutions to these problems here in Germany, like, for example, due diligence legislation, or as in German, it's Sorgfaltspflichten. Maybe you remember the last session we had with my two colleagues from Incota. And we will continue this search for solutions here in the global north in Germany in the previous sessions. Uh, we will talk about uh, the circular economy and the potentials of recycling. I think one discussant is here with us today, Andre Rückert. I, I saw him in the chat, which is great. But today we will widen the perspective a little bit and get to know some concepts or alternative approaches, as I would call them, from Uganda, the Philippines and Colombia. And I'm very happy to welcome three guests out of this countries today and yeah maybe just let me say i know there's a lot going on in your countries right now be it a new covid lockdown as lynn told me in uganda or with andres i talked about the the protests in in colombia and on top of that uh, we just talked about that in the Philippines, it's almost midnight right now. So, uh, yeah, just let me say it means a lot to me and to us that you guys uh, nevertheless managed to do join us today uh, to talk about alternatives to mining or maybe even concepts for a raw material transition from your perspective. And for us, it will be very interesting to hear what models or concepts you will present us today and yeah maybe also in a second step to hear from you what you expect from countries uh, in the global north like like germany maybe we will touch on that in the discussion as well and our plan for the next 90 minutes uh, is that we will have uh, three presentations each will be 15 minutes and after each presentation, we have a short Q&A. And like always, you can write your questions in the chat, or if you want, uh, you can turn on your microphone and uh, ask uh, one of the discussants directly. And in the end, uh, I think there will be a, a bit time so you guys uh, can react on each other and we have the possibility to discuss a little bit together. Uh, we will start with uh, JB today. He already switched on his camera, which is great. Uh, I will share his uh, presentation in a bit. Uh, JB uh, works for Alianza Tigelmina, uh, a coalition of organizations and groups who have decided to collectively challenge the aggressive promotion of large-scale mining in the Philippines, and he's the national coordinator for it. I'm very happy that you're here with us, JB, today. Maybe uh, you will say uh, a few sentences on uh, uh, ATM uh, and, and what else uh, you're doing there. That would be great. But for the beginning, uh, just let me ask you uh, the, the personal question or a little tradition in this lecture. How come you work on raw materials? How did you get involved with it? And I will uh, use the time to, to share your presentation in the meanwhile. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Julius, and uh, good afternoon to everyone there. Uh, I got involved in this discussion on raw materials because we've been having this campaign against destructive mining and our biggest commodities that are being mined here are gold copper and nickel and in one of our 
attempts to generate international solidarity, especially with uh, groups there in Europe or in the North America is, you know, aside from China, Europe is the next biggest destination of the copper and nickel that is being mined in the Philippines. And so in our engagements with other environmental and climate justice campaigners, we have been part of that link uh, that the Philippines and Indonesia and other third world countries are the source of the raw materials that is required by the developed countries. And so we would like to explore that link on maybe if we reduce the demand uh, from the first world countries, then the pressure to open up more mines here in the Philippines and in Indonesia or in Africa can also be lessened. Okay, so I, I'll proceed now with my sharing, Julius. Okay, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some stories about our struggles and advocacy here in the Philippines. I am very pleased to be part of this continuing lecture series forum. Uh, I, I've seen the infographic, the 12 arguments for a raw materials transition, and it's, it's, it's exciting to locate my topic as one of those that can make significant changes, not only to our lives, but also to the, the mode and form of growth there in Europe. So in the next 15 minutes, I will talk about the alternatives to destructive mining and highlight some reflection points from our experience. In doing so, next slide, I hope to answer and stress three major points. The first is alternatives to what? Why are we interested to talk about alternatives? But, but these reasons that I will be sharing are from the perspective of us here that are affected by mining and who is hosting the mining projects. The second point I would like to present is our attempt to propose an alternative framework of managing minerals. There is a current framework of extracting and profiting from minerals and we have seen the impacts of this. And so we would like to present an alternative framework of managing minerals. And this early, I would like to stress that part of managing minerals include the option of not touching the minerals, of leaving the minerals on the ground, because there might be more economic benefits if we leave the minerals there and not destroy forests and other natural resources. I will end my sharing with a set of new perspectives that we have been using as our arguments on why we need to challenge destructive mining. Do we, are we forced to accept mining as a way of life? And we have learned in the past few years that that's not true. There are ways that we need to challenge this framework. So alternatives to what? Next slide, please. I hope to answer this question. Uh, it's important, that, in my opinion, that any discussion on transition of raw materials start in recognizing that the extractive industry has a narrative. They have their own stories to weave. The mining industry, the oil, gas, and mining by itself has a narrative that says they are an important part of the economy. Now, here in the Philippines, the main narrative of the mining industry is they're doing sustainable mining or they are doing responsible mining. And it's important to present the alternative framework that this is fake news. This is not true. There is no such thing as sustainable mining. Um, at some point, the mining industry could not locate itself on the sustainable development 
uh, paradigm. And so they came up with the concept of sustainable mining. That was shut down by a lot of the global environmental groups because minerals themselves are finite and they can be depleted. And mining by itself, extraction and destroying natural resources is incompatible with the real principles of sustainable development. When they could not sell the idea of sustainable mining, they had to fall back on responsible mining as a concept. And we reject the fake news of responsible mining because there is no legal definition of responsible mining. Because there is no legal definition, there are no parameters to measure responsible mining. And since we cannot measure responsible mining, we cannot hold mining companies accountable for their violations. And so responsible mining is fake news. The second narrative that we want to expose, and we have to present an alternative to this, is that the mining industry keeps on telling us here in the, in the third world country that uh, because they have mining contracts, they claim to own the minerals and that they have rights as mining corporations this is totally not true this is a twisted uh this is twisting the truth and reality if you look at any constitution or any law it's the state and therefore the people belonging to that state who owns the minerals miners are given privileges through contracts to extract the minerals and profit from that activity by that definition, mining corporations do not have rights because the mining contract and the ability to extract minerals is a privilege given to them. However, if you take a look at any mining contract here in the Philippines, Indonesia, or any other mining host countries, a lot of attachments to these mining contracts include water rights, timber rights, easement rights mining companies own 10 meters to the left and the right side of any road that they construct in the mining area so so we have to disabuse the mining industry about these notions and third we need to present an alternative of what is really the true costs and the misleading benefits of mining you know any cost and benefit analysis of a mining project only involves what is the cost of doing the extraction and what is the profit from selling the minerals that is extracted but that is only half the story we need to give the whole picture the true costs of mining include environmental cost health cost social cost cultural cost political cost and misleading benefits of mining activities in when they claim that they bring roads schools clinics and livelihoods to the community but we forget those are social obligations of the government and when the state delegates those obligations to mining companies then our governments are breaking the social contract with the people who elected them so so i hope we, we've established that we need alternatives to dispel these notions that the mining industry is trying to sell to the communities and to our nations. So, how are we proposing this? Uh, next slide, Julius. Uh, of course, there are many ways of doing it. Let me focus on our proposal. Uh, in the Philippines, we're saying we need a new framework. We need a new blueprint. Basically, we need a new mining law to manage our minerals. And at the same time, make sure that we are in the direction of sustainable development. Um, just a quick introduction. Our mining law was passed in 1995. That is 26 years ago. So for any way you look at it, our mining law is blind to climate change. Our mining law is gender blind. Our mining law does not recognize disaster risk reduction. Um, and our mining law is in conflict with other laws here in the Philippines. We are not, the Philippines is not a federal government, but we do have a very strong decentralization law. And our mi mining law right now is in conflict with a lot of 
priorities of local governments. So when we wanted to offer an alternative, we said, we pose the challenge to our Congress and to our government. If you want to discuss responsible mining, and if you want to really benefit from mining, then we need a new mining law. And we're putting our bet on the table that this alternative framework would be the best formula for us. Some of the elements that we are putting forward in this alternative framework are this. Number one, the concept of no-go zones. Because the Philippines is an archipelago. Uh, we have 7,100 plus islands. We have fragile island ecosystems. We have a lot of protected areas. We are situated in the center of the hotspot of biodiversity. So basically, there should be some areas that cannot be open for mining. Interestingly, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature or IUCN, uh, identified category, what they call category six areas that cannot be opened to any economic activity. And the International Council of Mines and Metals committed themselves that they will not enter category six areas of IUCN. And these are the no-go zones for mining. So we put a list in this proposed law that certain areas must not be allowed for mining. Second, we wanted bigger roles and stronger voices of affected communities. Right now, affected communities, especially indigenous peoples, have no vote if they will allow or reject mining projects in their areas. Number three, as I've said, we are not a federal country, but we have a strong decentralization law. But at the way we are doing mining now and the way our mining law is uh, crafted, local decisions to reject mining is given very little weight in uh, eventually allowing mining. Fourth, we are proposing a broader set of impact assessments. Right now, the only requirement for a mining project is an environmental impact assessment or an EIA. We are proposing that we should put a human rights impact assessment. We need a gender impact assessment. We need a cultural impact assessment, especially if the mining project is going to enter the indigenous lands owned by the indigenous peoples, uh, especially because we have a unique law for indigenous peoples. We can actually give land titles to indigenous peoples here in the Philippines. Lastly, we demand a bigger tax for mining projects in the Philippines. Believe it or not, right now our tax for mining projects is only 2%. So for every 100 euro earned by a mining company, 2 euro goes to our government. Um, so really we are at the losing end uh, on taxing minerals here. But we, are all, we also want to make sure that future generations benefit should, should we allow mining and we would like the norwegian model of a sovereign wealth fund to be established here much like how norway is doing it in oil so so these are just some of the elements in our proposed alternative minerals management law on my last slide i would like to share these perspectives um, if we want to provide an alternative way of the mining industry, even our governments, to take a look at extraction, we have to broaden their understanding. Uh, you know, for, for more than three decades, the mining industry, the extractive industry, always believed that government will always support them, at least the Philippine government. But in the past three years, these are some of the realizations we've had. And, and uh, basically, the ones in yellow font are the, the comments from our grassroots uh, champions. And basically, these new perspectives allow us to move forward in our advocacy. First, we can ban open pit mining and we can cancel mine contracts, especially if they violate our environmental laws or if these mining projects fail to comply with their own 
contractual obligations. Now, before 2016, we didn't know we can actually close mines or ban them. But uh, it took a very pro-environment Minister of Environment and Natural Resources who had the balls to actually cancel mining contracts and she issued, she, a woman, Minister of our Environment, actually issued an, an order to ban open pit mining. And, and this is not uh, unique. We know El Salvador and Costa Rica has banned, has some form of ban on mining. Second, we need deeper transparency, and this should be part of that alternative framework. So, for example, in our case, we found out that politicians own the mines. And or during the electoral and campaign finance, the miners were giving money to our politicians, senators, and members of our parliament. And so we now, if it's very clear, why can't we regulate the mining industry properly? It's because the politicians and our leaders are beneficial owners. Of, and we have to uh, we have to separate them. We cannot allow the corporations to also control our government. Third, mining projects must respond to climate change issues. Um, if, you know, the ordinary farmer and the ordinary indigenous person knows that the floods and landslides are related to the mines because they have denuded the forest and the mine tailings dam is over flooding the river. So mining projects must not be blind to climate change impact. Well, the last point I want to make is there is a advocacy in a movement called the rights of nature that is gaining traction. This came from Bolivia. Uh, Andres can correct me if I, if I am wrong. Uh, and, but this has been supported by the, the church and the religious groups here in the Philippines. You are predominantly Christian. And when Laudato Si came out several years ago, this has been a main advocacy of environmental and faith-based groups that for us to be reminded that we are part of nature. And if we do not take care of nature, nature cannot take care of us. I'll end there and I really appreciate this opportunity to share our stories. I'm looking forward to an interaction later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, JB. That was a perfect timing. Just a second, I have to close your presentation. My microphone is switched on, yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, yes, I think uh, if people have questions uh, concerning your presentation right now, we could have uh, one or two, I think. We have a few minutes. Uh, I think uh, maybe I have one. <laughs> if nobody wants to start, yes, then, then I have a question for you. Uh, yes, you talked about this alternative mineral management bill you proposed. Um, I guess the government rejected it. I think it was an actual proposal, right, in the parliament. It was an actual law. Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that, how you see the chances of the Duterte government approving something like this. I heard from uh, Judy Passimio. Uh, she works uh, with LILAC, an organization. Uh, yes, I, I think you know her. Uh, that the Duterte government is pushing mining uh, in these days as a form of recovery uh, due to the uh, COVID crisis. And she's expecting even more uh, violence against indigenous women and more mining projects. So how do you see that development as well? And yes, maybe you can just comment on that and tell us more about this, this bill and the political process. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's a proposed law, so it has to pass Congress and Congress has to uh, enact it. Um, the proposed 
the new proposed new mining law took us about five years um, really from the grassroots and then we had the legal experts uh, craft the law and then we had actual legislators sit down with us um, and and the first time it was filed was about nine years ago 2012 but generally members of our senate and members of our uh, congress the house of representatives has advised us you know jb this law is so huge and you want to address everything from human rights to climate change to environment to local autonomy and to indigenous people's rights we will not be able to pass this mining law in its entirety we have been advised by senators and the parliamentarians look maybe it's better if we chop it into smaller pieces and let's pass a no-go zone law or let's pass a new tax law for minerals or let's pass a transparency law for extractive industry um, we said that's workable but you know that's defeating the purpose of actually reforming and we are not putting an alternative if to the actual uh, way we do minerals and economic development if we're going to do it piece by piece so we said both process should proceed we want the whole alternative minerals management law to be discussed and deliberated by congress but we are not going to oppose any piecemeal legislation that can pass through every year uh, one small law every year but uh, you know that observation is correct when this administration by president duterte came into power in 2016 he rode a wave of environmentalism the green movement uh, was kind of open to president duterte because he said he will stop mining uh, but one year left in his presidency he has totally reversed his course and he has used the COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse to allow more mining, especially miners and investors from China. Uh, but aside from that, one bitter lesson we have learned is that we can never support a green president whose hands are bloody red because of his total disregard and twisted notion of what human rights is. All right, thank you for that answer. There's another question about an ecocide law and how it could be uh, useful for your work. If you have a comment on that, maybe you you can give it right now. Um, if not, we save it for the discussion later. Yeah, I, 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 just a quick uh, point to that. We, we, we did broach the idea to a legislator uh, but the initial reaction of a member of Congress is the term ecocide has not yet been uh, legally defined here in the Philippines. And so it, they want it to be a separate trap. First, let's have an ecocide law. Yeah, that is possible. Uh, but we're not sure if our Congress is ready to discuss it. All right, thank you. Then I already see Lynn on my screen. That's great. Uh, Lynn Gitu joins us from uh, Uganda today. And uh, she's a program leader for Impact, an NGO she will present to us in uh, just a minute. Lynn, for you as well, the questions, how come you got involved with raw materials? Um, hi, everybody. Very excited to be part of, of this sharing. Um, I came to Raw Materials in 2010. I'm, I'm a lawyer by training. I did some litigation, going to court, carrying around case files, got bored with it. And then in 2010, I, I joined a small uh, national NGO whose work was focused on the petroleum and mining sector. And that's how my journey with uh, raw materials began. Uh, yeah, so this year 
this year in March, I made 11 years in, in the mining sector, in the civil society development world um, arm of things. All right, so I'll just share my screen now. Is it is it on? Yes, it's on. Just okay. have to go to present yeah, mode. Because right. now we have to click on presentation mode, I, I think, or full screen. Uh, okay. Is Yeah, I've put full screen on my side. It's still not showing full screen? No, I don't see it full screen. That's weird. Uh oh. Oh, that's strange. If not. Okay. Have it, has it worked? It's not full screen. Um, uh. But maybe we we can do the same. I, I think you send it as well to me, right? Your presentation. Yes, I did. Yes. Yes, I did. All right. Then I will share my screen and you just have to say next slide. Okay. Yes, and we do it like with JB. Okay. Here it is. Yeah. You should see it. Thank now. you. Perfect. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so we can we can start the next slide. This is just the the title slide. Okay, so in terms of a presentation outline, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to impact um, uh, the the NGO uh, f f in which I serve. Uh, then I'll speak about the mining sector in the Great Lakes region. Uh, give an overview of that. And then I'll speak something about responsible mineral supply chains. And then a shift in Uganda's mining sector. And then uh, finally, what can Germany uh, stroke the global north do? So next slide, please. All right, so IMPACT was established in 1986 uh, under the name Pub Partnership Africa Canada, and it operated as a Canadian civil society coalition tasked with distributing funding from the Canadian International Development Agency to address the root causes of conflict and to promote development, specifically in Africa. In the mid-1990s, IMPACT's role disbursing funds ended and the organization grew into a global leader on research and policy related to conflict diamonds, uh, specifically, and minerals. Uh, we were part of uh, the development of the Kimberley process uh, for, for diamonds. The organization's tagline, transforming natural resource management, empowering communities, conveys IMPACT's commitment to provide capacity and spotlight to local actors to mobilize and challenge how their natural resources are managed. Impact investigates how natural resources are managed and how these systems can be improved. Based on recommendations from, it, from its research, Impact develops and delivers innovative systems for the management of natural resources through technical assistance and capacity building. Impact as well engages stakeholders across all sectors, including policymakers, industry, and local communities to improve natural resource management. Uh, currently, Impact is um, Ottawa-based and has offices in DRC, in Uganda, and in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so... Um, when we talk about the uh, raw materials transition conversation, uh, it's important to, to understand the context in, in which we discuss it. So JB has discussed the Philippines um, uh, understanding or, or, or approach um, and ideas towards uh, raw materials uh, transition. Uh, I might have a, a slightly different view, uh, but 
I, I, I hope that we understand that it, it comes from, from uh, the context uh, from which I come. Impact work within the Great Lakes region has allowed me to, uh, as an individual, but also even as uh, many other colleagues, has allowed us to, to interact with uh, at least 12 countries within the Great Lakes region uh, of Africa. So East, East Central and Southern Africa, um, uh, some countries that we have uh, worked in. Okay, so the Great Lakes region of Africa is abundant in natural resources, including high valued minerals such as tin, tantalum, tungsten, uh, cobalt, lithium, and gold which are important components of everyday products like cell phones, iPads, refrigerators, jewelry, airplane components, automobiles, and more. Up to 90% of the region's minerals are produced by the artisanal and small scale mining sector. For decades, these minerals have been used by artisanal miners in the Great Lakes region of Africa as a primary source of income. And even though artisanal mining is characterized by low financial returns, and often heightened health and safety risks, as well as corruption and criminality. Over 1 million artisanal and small scale miners in the DRC uh, depend on the informal mineral trade alone, while over 30,000 artisanal and small scale miners in Uganda alone depend on the extraction and trade of gold for livelihood. For many years, minerals such as tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold have been used by armed groups in the DRC and neighboring countries as a source of financing. Uh, furthermore, control over these lucrative natural resources has become a source of conflict many times with armed groups fighting to retain access. Many of these groups have been accused of committing serious human rights violations, including forced labor, child labor, and sexual violence. Uh, next slide, please. So understanding uh, these challenges, um, there's, there's been a big conversation within the region about responsible mineral supply chains. So at the Great Lakes uh, region level, uh, there have been efforts to curb illegal exploitation of natural resources through the work of the regional body, the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region, ICJLR. The regional certification mechanism, also RCM, for the minerals tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold, is aligned with the OECD due diligence guidance for responsible mineral supply chains, and as such provides detailed recommendations to help companies respect human rights and avoid contributing to conflict through their mineral purchasing decisions and practices. So far, four countries, Rwanda, DRC, Tanzania, and Burundi, out of 12 member countries of the ICGLR are implementing the RCM framework and two countries, Uganda and Zambia, are in final stages to begin implementing it. Next slide, please. Um, again, the first couple of slides have just been giving an overview uh, of the mining sector and responsible supply chains in, in within the Great Lakes region. Uh, all of this is to just lay a, a foundation. Uh, so I'll, I, in this slide, I'll focus on, on Uganda's mining sector and how uh, connected it could be uh, to the conversation around raw materials transition. Uh, so I'll just concentrate on three main points. The first one is the Mining and Minerals Bill 2020 and the ASM sector. Currently, there are efforts underway within the Uganda government to overhaul the mining sector legislative framework. The current mining law in Uganda does not recognize the artisanal and small scale mining sector, yet it's the largest producer of minerals in the country. So, um, Conversations around uh, formalization, professionalization, uh, support in terms of access to finance and, and access to machinery for, for the artisanal and small scale mining sector are very big right now uh, within the country. Uh, the second shift I could say in Uganda's mining sector is 
uh, Uganda recognizing rights of nature, uh, customary laws, and sacred natural sites. In 2019, Uganda became the first nation in Africa to recognize the rights of nature in national legislation under Section 4 of the National Environment Act. Now, in Western Uganda, where there is um, uh, substantial um, deposits of petroleum, indigenous Bagungu communities, traditional leaders, and Buddhist, Bulisa District Council have gone a step further, pioneering di district level legislation to protect sacred natural sites and recognize the customary laws of the Bagungu people. Uh, just a point to note, this, this area in Western Uganda where there is large, uh, this substantial deposits of, of petroleum is also one of the most uh, ecologically sensitive uh, regions in our country. And there's, there are statistics that can be found online about uh, certain rare bird species and, and, and some, some animal species, some reptile species that can only be found in this, in this particular region um, in East Africa, for example, or in, in some statistics, it's like the whole of Africa some of these bird species maybe or animal species only exist in this particular place. So this was a big step uh, because now uh, with, with the passing of that uh, section in the National Environment Act, it affects how international oil companies operate uh, in the region and how they, they do it in relation to the environment. The third thing is um, around impact assessments. Uganda's legal framework has provision for mandatory impact assessments to be done uh, before any mining project is commenced. These are environmental impact assessments. Of, of recent, uh, they've introduced what they call a social impact assessment. And within the social impact assessment, um, there has to be done a human rights assessment, a gender impact, impact assessment, and so on. <laughs> Excuse me. However, with uh, the new mining law, uh, this Mining and Minerals Bill 2020, when it's passed after it has gone through the parliament and been discussed, gender impact assessments will also now be specifically mandatory as well. I think these are... Uh, some key shifts that uh, that I wanted to highlight in this short time. Next slide, slide, please. So in light of all of these things, what can Germany or the Global North do? How can they uh, participate? Um, three things, again, for me. The first one is support ASM formalization, value addition, and access to markets or, or building of markets. The ASM sector within Africa's mining sector is a chief source of livelihoods for many people on the continent. The option, therefore, of leaving minerals in the ground is, is largely untenable and would be opposed uh, even by mining communities themselves. Thus, the role a country like Germany can play in improving matters would be to support the processes of formalization of the ASM sector, um, value addition to minerals in country or in the regions, and support these mineral products access to markets or even building of markets uh, at the continent level. This, this ties in with my next point, uh, responsible mining by large scale mining companies. Large-scale mining companies mostly originate from the global north. As such, strict, stricter, stricter measures through their government's own legislation can be used to enforce responsible mining, even when they operate in the global south in search of raw materials. Lastly, rights of nature and earth jurisprudence. Um, this area of law is nascent in the continent of Africa. I think that Germany or the Global North uh, Development Funds can be channeled to growth of awareness about the rights of nature, as well as legal work around the issue to increase earth jurisprudence so that where applicable communities can be involved in protecting their sensitive environment over and above benefiting from mining sector extraction. So, I mean, with this, I, 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 I think I, I would say I submit 
um, my my understanding of of the conversation around uh, raw materials uh, transition is as is kind of like a sense of awareness coming over the global north about um, how their demand for raw materials from the global south affects the global south uh, largely negatively but then also how uh, the, 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 the raw materials or even their products uh, affect the environment, water, air, uh, land, and so on. And so with understanding that, uh, I think we, we always need to be, to be careful not to, um, um, not to throw out the baby with a bathwater. That's a, an English saying. I, I don't know if there's a, an equivalent in, in German. Uh, but in the sense, uh, if, you, if you want to throw, you want to pour out the, the bath, the water in which a baby has bathed, um, uh, you, you don't throw out the baby too. You throw out the water and, and then, you know, you keep, you keep a clean baby. Yeah. So I, I, I have always thought, and, and this is my personal opinion, um, uh, I've always thought that, that when, it, when it comes to, to, to minerals and the mining sector within Africa, um, they, this sector supports a huge number of, um, of people uh, within, within the continent. Uh, it's a form of livelihood like agriculture or fishing. And, and because of that, to, to say that we leave the, the minerals in the ground would deprive them of, of this, this source of livelihood. I think that what would be better would be to, to, to clean up uh, the sector and, 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 allow, and allow these huge numbers of people to continue to do to do their work and to earn a living uh, from the work that they they do there and and I believe that the the global north has a, a big part to play in in, in achieving this um, yeah I think that's pretty much it from me uh, the next slide is just a, um, a thank you uh, slide thank you for listening to me uh, you can get to know more about impact from um, our website and um, on social media impact transform thank you very much julius thank you very much lynn perfect timing as well uh, in fact the german saying is completely the same to to throw out the child mm -hmm. with, with the bath water so <laughs> It's a really di direct translation for us. Uh, there's one question which is really interesting. I, I wanted to get to this point as well. Um, mm -hmm. Andre Rückert asks, um, because you mentioned on a slide and you talked about responsible mining, what mm -hmm. would be your definition for it? Because JB was really critical on the question whether there is such a thing um mm. maybe mm. we we can talk mm. about it uh, later in the discussion as well you already mentioned it's of course because of your regional backgrounds which are very different mm. so maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that um i am happy to elaborate now or oh. yes you want me to do it now you can okay. do it now we, we have like 10 minutes okay all right so so in in I, I think I think what JB was saying is is that uh, in in terms of criticizing and JB you correct me if if I understood you wrong I think what what JB was saying in terms of uh, responsible mining not really being you know not really existing and therefore he called it fake news um, is. I guess what he was trying to touch on is the issue of implementation. The idea of responsible mining is, is simply that we are making sure that the, the mineral supply chain is clean, quote unquote, 
it's clean because um, if you 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 follow the one kilogram of gold from mine site X in 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 Kasanda in Uganda, uh, artisanal mine site X, uh, that mine site does not have um, child labor existent on the mine site. Um, there is there is there there are, there are ways and means in which uh, sexual and gender based violence is is um, is is curbed or is minimized uh because to be honest in in any in any social setting it, it's impossible to absolutely not have any sort of you know sexual uh, and gender based violence to be honest uh but but this mindset has certain rules and regulation that make sure that that this is minimized uh this mindset has um uh, environmental standards uh, that are set up, uh, uh, procedures, and so on. The mine site, the mine pits in that site are, are built with with an with uh, respect to the environment and health and safety, and so on and so on. So on. The water, the water supply for this mine site is is uh, properly managed and uh, there is no mingling uh, commingling with uh, the water supply for the mining community and so on and so forth okay so the mine site is clean this one kilogram of gold came from a mine site in kasanda in uganda um and and you know uh, traveled from kasanda which is about 380 kilometers from the, the city kampala yeah and it traveled from from that clean mine site it got to 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 kampala went through the processes of uh of of being taxed by the government so the right taxation has been done uh so the government gets some revenue and then this gold uh makes its way out of the country um uh, through a proper a proper channel okay so the idea behind responsible mining is is actually really good and it is achievable i think what jb was touching on is 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 the the level of commitment the 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 realization for for some of us uh development or civil society or non-governmental organization practitioners we have seen um that that usually where the rubber meets the road is is implementation so we have the oecd due diligence guidelines we have the regional certification mechanism we have the kimberley process and 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 so on and so forth and and governments and mining companies and so on are are involved in the development of these frameworks but when it comes to 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 implementation the mining companies collude with governments or the governments collude with mining companies and and in the end the things that that were the, the goals that were set out uh, for are not achieved so responsible mining per se is is just the 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 the, the doing mining in a responsible manner uh, whatever that means you know doing mining in a responsible manner making sure that you do it in a way that doesn't endanger people or the environment so it is possible i i just think that a lot more work needs to be done in in, in uh, by way of um, implementation so like i i suggested the, the the big mining companies the big oil companies come from the global north right uh, they're the ones that have the money and so on so they can if if legislation came from them or came from the the countries from where they originate it is most likely that um, they would adhere to those measures much better than than the case that we see where where many of these uh, big companies mining and petroleum companies come to the global south and then they say Oh, we are we are following the laws and regulation of the country where we, we operate. And once we come to that, um, I can 
hear, hear you right now. I don't know whether it's just me, but I think your microphone just No, me stopped. neither. Ah, no, you neither. Lynn, can you hear us? She's still talking, so maybe you have to restart your microphone or unplug it and plug it back in because unfortunately we don't hear you anymore. Hello. Yeah, now you're back. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I know I, I was I was done. I hope I hope not too much was was muted. Yes, I thanks for for I think you you made your point and uh, thanks for mentioning the due diligence legislation for instance in Germany uh, our last session was about it um, the German parliament just passed a, a law that aims mm -hmm. to uh, hold companies accountable for human rights and environment with a lot of flaws and shortcomings we discussed it uh, a week ago but I think it's an important point you mentioned. I think Saskia has a question as well. Maybe we can save it for the discussion in the end. For later. Yeah, yeah. for later. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Mm. Because uh, we shouldn't uh, be running out of time for Andres. Um, thank you, Lynn, again. Um, I think uh, we Thank will have time in the end. I think there, there are many interesting points. I, I want to get to uh, the rights of nature. You both mentioned, I, I think Andres has something to say about it as well. Because I know in, in Latin America, it's a huge discussion in, in some countries. Maybe we can save that for the end. And uh, right now you, you, you start your presentation. I first want to introduce you, uh, Andres Angel. Works works with uh, Aida, the Interamericana, uh, par uh, uh, pardon, the Asociación Interamericana para la Defensa del Ambiente. Aida, no, it's correct. And he works as a scientific advisor. And Aida uses the law and science to protect the environment and communities suffering from environmental harm uh, in Latin America. And yeah, you're joining us today from Bogota, the capital of Colombia. Um, it's great that you're here with us. Uh, welcome again. And yes, maybe you could share a sentence or two as well where, how uh, your connection to, to the mining topic emerged, why you get involved with it. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh my connection so i'm a geologist and i come from a very conflictive country that's <laughs> all you need to know right um yeah at the first in my career i didn't know what to do i didn't know if i was going to get into mining into oil into whatever volcanoes glaciers whatever branch of the geosciences but i really started seeing the conflict around uh, minerals around oil I started seeing the violence and I just couldn't like look away. So I started working in that. That's basically the reason. <laughs> so do you want me to start All right. right now? Thank you. Yes, the stage is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much everybody. Hallo Leute. And I think it's already very late there in Germany. So, so sorry. I will try to keep it short. So uh, I'm going to try to respond to Julius questions about the Rohstoffwende and all these things. And by doing so, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's going on right now in Latin America. So as Julius mentioned, we are AIDA. We have offices everywhere from San Francisco to Santiago de Chile. Uh, we are registered in Mexico and in the United States in San Francisco, but we are a regional NGO made by Latin American people for Latin American people. Um, and we do this work with law and science, which is really awesome. And I wish more NGOs in the world would do that because it's really, really nice. So I'm going to talk about two things mainly, a short brief message from the communities, from what I feel should be said about what the communities are feeling. I have direct contact with them. So I feel it's 
the, the first thing I have to do every time is to talk from their perspective because they are receiving the impacts. And then I'm going to talk about some advocacy efforts that we are undertaking in AIDA. So first of all, from the communities. Uh, there are two main points here that I want to make. The first one is that the mindset that you got that got you in the trouble is not going to get you out of it. So we cannot just pass from an oil and hydrocarbons extractivism to mining extractivism and keep dreaming that we can grow the economy uh, and keep it growing forever. That's absolutely absurd in a finite planet. And the second thing that I think it's more of a tongue twister that I made up yesterday <laughs> is that just a transition is not a just transition, right? So it means that, yes, we can change our Volkswagen for a Tesla, but that doesn't mean that that's fair because you don't know where the materials come from. I know that there has been a lot of discussion in this uh, space about this, so I'm not going to, to go again and tell you the same things over and over, but we need to understand who needs the materials for which countries, what for they need it, what is left for the communities, and if we are going to allow at a global scale, because this already exists in countries like Chile, sacrifice zones, which means that they're they are like zones where the state doesn't guarantee your right to health or your right to a healthy environment. Are we going to allow that to a global level? We need to get into that discussion and we need to get into the discussion uh, of uh, the Rostov Bende. And precisely on the Rostov Bende report, absolute reduction is necessary, is not desirable, is necessary and it's urgent. It's achievable through degrowth, but it's not needed for every country in the world to degrowth at the same rate uh, at the same time. That's my my view and the view of many other uh, researchers. We have there, for example, Johan Rockström, you must know it from the peak, who is saying that we can be stewards of the planet, but we need to, in the global north, reduce uh, the consumption of materials, global north and maybe probably our cities here in the global south, so that many more people can get access to those resources to have a minimum living standard. Uh, I don't know if you have discussed donut economy here, but that's a good like uh, example of how to do it. Uh, and to meet the minimum social demands, but not uh, stepping over the ecological ceilings that we have. So that would be the, the first thing. And the other thing, the reflection that I always get from the communities, and actually one of the reflections that I started with when I decided to get into environmental geology or ecological geology, as I like to call it, is, is this absolutely necessary? I mean, are we doing this because we cannot live without these materials, with this amount of materials? Because it's not the materials itself themselves. It's the amount, it's the volume, the sheer volume that we are exploding uh, all over the world, in Philippines, in Uganda, in Colombia, everywhere. If the answer is no, then no. The answer from us, from the communities, is no as well. We are not going to let you build your project. It is not essential for mankind to live well on the planet. If the answer is yes, then in what scenario is it essential? Are you thinking about 10% annual growth? Are you thinking about degrowth? Are you thinking about having 10 billion people over the planet? Uh, what is the, the, the scenario? And we are seeing things like that. I don't know if you read the news yesterday or the day before, but this is just from a couple of days ago. Amazon warehouse just destroys unsold items. So we make cell phones, we make computers, whatever, which are deemed essential, and then they get destroyed because of market failures and coordination failures. And if you are telling me that we are destroying ecosystems for this or to make a platinum badge for a, a hypercar, well, the answer is no. Um, and it's, it's not about feelings, it's not about anything. This is a rational discussion and has to be met with numbers. And these figures that you see in your screen are from the industry itself, from the mining sector. Uh, you can see that, I'm sorry, it's in Spanish because, well, I had it prepared for Spanish and I couldn't translate it. Uh, the blue one is technology, 
that we use, and you can see 2010, 15, 19, and 20, you see that there is more or less a stability used for technology. Bars and coins, the green one, also pretty much stable, but banks, uh, they fluctuate a lot, and ETFs, exchange traded funds, they also fluctuate a lot. And you can see a huge difference from 2019 and all the former years, basically, to 2020. That has to do with the pandemic. We are using gold. This is for gold. This is for gold extraction and the gold market in the world. And the cipher, the, the figures are from the World Gold Council. And you can see how the ETFs have passed from 9% to 35%, while the technology mm -hmm. sector has actually decreased 1%, which is not at all relevant. It's like a normal fluctuation of that. So the fact that they say that this is absolutely needed, that we need this, that we are going to die without this, well, it's very questionable. Uh, Carla Schulte said ETFs, yes, exchange traded funds. Okay, that's the meaning. And not only that, we are getting worse at recycling the materials. These again are so, <laughs> no worries, Carla. Thank you. These are again uh, figures from the World Gold Council, which say that mine production is increasing, and while mine production globally is increasing, our capacity to recycle the gold is decreasing. So this gap is getting larger and larger. And we are in a throughput uh, economy, in a linear economy, and we are not achieving circular economy, if that can be achieved. And if you ask me if I prefer a new cell phone, actually, I bought mine in 2013, Alexander Platz. It's working great. Uh, if you ask me if I need a new cell phone or if I prefer to preserve my Paramos and my ecosystems, well, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind or the mind of the communities that we are not going to allow any project to go on. And the second part is advocacy efforts. So one major advocacy effort that I've made, uh, it's been already two years approximately, is about perpetual impacts. I know you know about this because in, in West Germany, in, sorry, in the West of Germany, <laughs> uh, you have this problem. Right, you have the Ewigkeitskosten from from uh, coal mining, and you know what uh, would happen if the if the pumps would stop pumping in areas like Duisburg or Bochum or Dortmund. So you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but also, perpetual impacts has to have to do with water quality. We have done a lot of advocacy. We have talked in the House of Representatives of Colombia, in the National Congress of Ecuador, in the Agro-Environmental Tribunal of Bolivia, and we have told them that uh, this is a really, really important topic. We uh, in AIDA cannot do lobbying because that's forbidden by the Un United States law, but we can educate the legislator on topics, and that's what we are doing with this uh, topic of perpetual impacts with these th three um, like characteristics that I have proposed. Uh, there is a publication that I made, which is the first publication in Spanish about the topic of perpetual impact, and we will go. Um, I will leave the link in the in the last part of the of the presentation. It contains 11 recommendations for my country, for Ecuador, for Bolivia, for any Latin American country or any country in the world to avoid perpetual impacts from mining. So when we talk about responsible mining, we should be very careful to talk about perpetual impacts because even if it's legal, even if it pays taxes, even if everything is uh, transparent, let's, let's say, if you're leaving perpetual impacts, that takes you to a different um, you know, ethical discussion about intergenerational justice. Protecting a strategic ecosystem, does, that has been a second, uh, like major topic, which is that we uh, in Colombia, for example, we have the protection of the paramos, which are these high uh, Andean ecosystems that they basically provide for all the water in the cities of many countries, but they are not protected everywhere. So we need to know uh, which ecosystems should be specially protected because of the ecosystems functions and the services that they provide. And because of the things that Lynn said, like endemism and anything like that. So 
that would be a good example. Ecuador, for example, this is a picture from Ecuador, uh, doesn't have a legislation on uh, paramos protection. So that's the thing that we are trying to advocate for. Not the legislation, because we cannot do that, but to educate on the need for protection for the paramos. There's another thing which is central and has to do with the link between human rights and the environment and this prior consult consultation and autonomy. There's a huge misunderstanding by design from the companies between information and consent. So they inform you about the project. They say, oh, we're going to your house in Dresden and we are going to tear it down because we want a park. And they confuse, they mistake that for consent. So they said, no, you, I gave you the information. So we have the consent for, for doing that. And the fact is that it's not possible to confuse those two. Uh, there are each time more and more local consultations and votings, and national governments are determined to strike down those mechanisms. So, so they are talking a lot about um, social licensing, but when you propose, for example, a referendum in the impact area of projects, they say that's illegal because the national interest oversees the, the local interest. But there are many good examples about this in, for example, territorial planning. There are mining bans on the way in certain local areas in Ecuador, in Bolivia, and in Colombia. And uh, we actually have had a very good experience about perpetual impacts with people who have proposed mining bans or moratoria in their municipalities based on the argument of perpetual impacts. Uh, and I mentioned these four consultations, these votings, referendums, because they have been very important. They have been historical votes in the struggle against uh, large scale mining. And the first one is in red because actually a court uh, annulled that consultation because of issues of coordination and co-responsibility between the local, regional and national levels. You have to understand that all four of these consultations were approved by the government. So the fact that they are being annulled afterwards is absolutely outrageous. And of course, the companies systematically attack the right of consultation. One example in Cajamarca, according to the people who were there, is that they invited the people to a trip the very day of the consultation so they, that they couldn't vote. These kind of practices are far from ethical uh, corporative responsibility. And of course, there's a strategy of networks. As you know, I'm based in Colombia, but I don't work in Colombia. I work everywhere, not only in Colombia, but everywhere in Latin America. And we are uh, seeing that many efforts of strategic litigation networks and a network that I'm coordinating, a study group on extractivism, uh, are getting stronger and stronger. That's another alternative that we can take. About legal initiatives, I'm going to try to, s <laughs> to end up really quick to wrap up because I know that my time is getting to an end. Uh, legal alternatives, new crime typologies. This is from yesterday, Deutsche Welle, uh, a report on ecocide. So that's something. In Bolivia, it's working. In uh, Ecuador, it seems it could be something, although the new government, we don't know much how it's going to react. Uh, but the fact is that we have huge problems in implementation. If you read the constitution of Latin American countries, they are beautiful, but <laughs> practically 1% of them is being implemented. So uh, the problem is in implementation. And that's a criticism that I personally have with rights of nature. You cannot give rights to everything because uh, you need to implement it. You need to like be sure that you can make it. So giving rights just by giving rights is not the, the answer. I, I think that you have to have a lot of careful uh, movements in the fact that you might be just converting this into a trend and actually not acting upon it. That, that's my concern, but I support mm. the, the rights of nature, of course. Um, strengthening the, the bonds mm. between human rights and nature's rights. We have decisions from the Inter-American Human Rights Court, from uh, international treaties, regional treaties, like the Escazú Agreement, who tie those two. And of course, the use of precautionary principle, which we always do uh, in AIDA and many other organizations. 
Uh, finally, environmental due diligence, as Yuli said, there is uh, conversations about this in Europe and we are trying to do advocacy efforts with German Watch. Uh, there's a publication coming in the coming uh, weeks, probably in the coming months, about uh, environmental due diligence, mandatory environmental due diligence in the United, in the European Union, sorry. And uh, we are asking for, among other things, more information and transparency standards, quantifiable, please, environmental permits for exploration activities, not only exploitation, but the, the, the environmental conflict starts when the companies come to explore the resources, so we should act there. The strengthening of community monitoring initiatives and legal validity of the data that is collected, that's very important. Independent environmental impact assessments, as you know, uh, and this happens all over the world, but it's something absurd. The companies that are interested in the project are the ones who hire the companies that do the environmental impact assessments. That creates a very obvious conflict of interest between those two. So that has to be broken down immediately. And of course, institutional capacity building. The people in the, in the institutions, in the agencies and the ministries, they are, don't have the capacity to read an EIA. They don't have the technical knowledge to understand to fully understand an EIA from a large scale mine, which is absolutely and utterly complex. So we need to build that capacity. And on the Rostock vendor report, well, of course, industrial consumption se sectors, they need to reduce the raw material consumption. I think most of the, if not all, I think all of the proposals are great and they should be, like they are the first steps to do larger things. So all of these should be developed. Um, I welcome a lot the effort that was made in this report. It's an, it's an awesome report. It has a lot of recommendations, very interesting. Uh, I will leave you some resources, of course. There are many more, but I, I will leave you just the ones that are more relevant. And uh, of course, you can find me uh, there if you have any interest of working in Latin America or doing things in this topic, research, whatever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres. Yes, thank you for mentioning uh, the brochure as well we published. Um, I'm very glad to hear that you like it and you reflected on the points we made there as well. And you also made the, the, the case for the donut economy, for the scheme and for degrowth as well. I think those are very interesting concepts. I would recommend to all of you to, to Google them if you haven't heard about it there's also i think there are also good youtube uh, videos about them uh, just maybe five or ten minutes that uh, explain these concepts in a short and interesting way all right since we have only eight minutes left um if there's a question just to andres now is the time for it uh, if not, I would invite the other two, uh, uh, Saskia, but you wrote just to me in private. Maybe you have a question to Andres. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I would also be interested in your opinion about sustainable mining and if it's possible. And if uh, yeah, mining is not sustainable, what would be yeah, an option to still have, yeah, like mobile phones and stuff, how would we produce it if we are not um, able to extract raw min minerals? Okay, so uh, sustainable mining, it depends. I think that the problem is that a lot of RP has gotten into this language. A lot of RP is uh, in responsible mining, a lot is in sustainable mining. You have to define, I'm a scientist, <laughs> you have to define mm -hmm. what uh sustainable means mm -hmm. for you in order for i to for me to respond you know like sustainable means as as jb suggested uh it's a finite resource that you take once and you cannot produce anymore somebody turned on her microphone can you switch it off please Die Stummschaltung ist aktiviert. Die Stummschaltung ist aufgehoben. Okay, great. I just muted everyone, so I'm um, I'm gone. Perfect. That happens. 
of course. So yeah, if, if sustainable means that you can do this over and over again, it, it could be, but of course, sustainability should be focused on the circular economy, shouldn't be focused on the linear economy. So it shouldn't be focused on extracting, using and throwing away. It should be focused on extracting from urban sources. When I stop using the cell phone, let's extract what there is in there and recirculate that's sustainable to me because sustainable i have a very good like definition it's in spanish i'm very sorry of sustainability that i put it in the document that i wrote and it has to do i, I actually found it it's not mine it's a characteristic of a system to persist in a state that is of itself that it's like a characteristic of itself for as long as it can well, if, if that's sustainability, uh, I'm sorry for the schlecht translation there, but um, if that's sustainability, then no, no, anything that has to do with non-renewable resources is unsustainable. Um, I would think that we don't need more inputs of materials, um, of the materials that we already have in excess uh, for the new economy. If we have gold in excess, we have... 8,000 tons of gold in the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. Of course, this is a very, very, very deep uh, questioning of the system. And someone wrote it in the chat, actually. It's, it, it has to do with the gold being a reserve of value. Yes, maybe we should take that characteristic out of gold in order for this to work. If we want a revolution, we cannot just uh, uh, do very small things and expect great results. So, yeah, I, I don't think that can be sustainable. And I think that for the materials we need to have, we need to have the conversation with the people that are in the places uh, of the materials. If we need more lithium, and remember, we have to make sure that we really need it. If we need the copper for uh, electromobility or we need the copper for the wind turbines, then let's have the conversation with the people and let's see how uh they are willing to allow this but we need to do it from the technical side right now companies are blackmailing people with gold mines because they are saying gold is used for telecommuting for for your work at home gold is using for is being used for the respirators in the intensive care unit so you need to give us this opportunity because we are saving the world so right now the people who have caused perpetual impacts for hundreds of years they're trying to tell us that they need that that we need to save the world and the only path to save it is them i know that climate change is a big urgency probably the largest but we need to avoid environmental problem shifting that's my position thank you andres I would invite JB and Lynn to join us for the last uh, minutes because I want to give you guys a chance to maybe have some maybe have some concluding remarks or you want to react on something one of the other discussants said, then you have the chance right now. Uh, JB, you look like you wanted to say something. Great. Sure. Thank you, Julius, and thank you to Lynn and to Andres. For, thanks for all the questions in the chat box. I would like to two points as my concluding remarks. First is that it is very important that we keep in mind that we are extracting minerals, but the way we are doing it, we want the, at least the mining industry is extracting minerals for profit. But I think the more important question, which has also been raised by Lynn and Andres, is who benefits from extracting these minerals? Second, I totally agree. Any discourse on a transition must start on a circular economy framework. Um, anything that proceeds from this linear uh, way of economic growth will always will always go back to over extraction and over production and useless consumption until our economic thinkers start 
recognizing and valuing the circular economy, the bitter lessons and the bitter stories of affected communities will never go away. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. I agree with you, JB. Uh, just to add, and, and thank you, JB and Andres and and uh, Julius and Saskia and everybody for being part of this uh, part of this uh, lecture. Uh, I I I have gotten a, a, a new idea, I would say, from from the chat, an idea around renewable energy and how that renewable energy ties into the conversation around uh, all alternatives to to mining or to the mining sector. I think maybe that is an angle that that uh, Inkota might be interested in in pursuing. Uh, but other than that, thank you very much for your time. Uh, this was fun. Thank you. Yes was fun and I, I really enjoyed your presentations and yes thank you for making the case for circular economy I think it's a uh, yeah perfect concluding remark as well because our next two sessions will be about electronic waste recycling and the circular economy so yeah thank you for that um, yeah, I, I'm very glad that, that you joined us today and we will upload your presentations for the students. If you have uh, any recommendations or links you, uh, you want to put in, you can do it as well. Otherwise, I think, yeah, just one from Andres is, uh, I don't have it yet. And yeah, I hope we can continue the conversations in another format in another context um, we will keep in touch um, right now we are out of time so uh, thank you again and thanks to everybody who was here with us today i wish you all a pleasant morning afternoon and night i guess <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you very much to the students and participants, uh, see you next week. I'm looking forward to it. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank bye you, bye. Julius. Feel free to approach. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye.